This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been in practice for 25 years. And I started podcasting to extend the walls of my practice, not only to people who might have been in therapy or are considering therapy, but to people who might never walk through the door of a therapist, but are a little curious about what someone like me would have to say. So welcome if you're any or all of the above. Today, we're going to be talking about social anxiety. Now, performance anxiety is actually the number one kind of anxiety in the United States when you struggle to get up in front of people and give a speech or something. But social anxiety affects 15 million of us, and so it's roaring up to second in line. And what I've noticed about our culture is that we seem to be becoming a bit commitment phobic as well. I've laughed and said, are we losing our manners? Or is it really social anxiety? Maybe manners is an outdated thing, I don't know, but I I hope not in many ways. So we'll talk a little bit about how social anxiety and commitment or avoidance of commitment may go hand in hand. I'm going to offer an exercise with specific questions to help you address your anxiety and specific things you can do to try to approach a social situation with less anxiety. And then our email from a listener today is a thank you, which is, of course, always nice, but also a comment on fixing problems that seem to recur. She was bothered in many ways that she had problems that, quote-unquote, wouldn't go away. And so I'm going to share what I've observed after many years of being a therapist about problems that keep popping up. It's more normal than you think. So let's get talking about social anxiety and the tendency to avoid commitment. My husband and I threw a Super Bowl party many years ago, and you know, we should have known better. A lot of our friends are more artsy people, theater people, and they're just not football geeks like us. I have to tell you the story of how I became a football geek here. I was in graduate school, and I was living in Dallas, and of course, the Dallas Cowboys were huge back then. This was in the late 80s, and I got divorced for the second time. And my weekends were just yawning in front of me. I didn't want to study all the time. So I got a rowing machine, and I started watching Dallas Cowboy football. And they had a horrible season the first year I watched, like 1 in 15. And then I had to laugh at myself and say, wait a minute, you're 0 for 2. This team and you are in the same place, so keep on watching. And sure enough, about three years after that, they won three Super Bowls in four years, something like that. Anyway, back to my Super Bowl story. We'd invited about 30 people to this party, set up an extra TV in our living room. It was such a big deal. Our son, around five at the time, he'd made this really colorful poster, which was hanging proudly by the television. He was so excited about the big day and the big crowd. He was literally off the charts. And I'd fixed mountains of football food. Well, game time arrived, and six people were there. They stood around a bit awkwardly, not knowing each other well, not knowing whether to stay in the living room or go in the den. We practically had one television per person, not really, but it seemed like that at the time. Another 10 or so people showed up maybe two hours later, mostly for the food, and the others we never heard from, not a peep. Now, we've long moved on, but we definitely have stayed away from hosting another football event. Recently, a friend who had thrown a big nonprofit bash in her home talked to me and said, you know, I invited well over 100 people, but she said I only had RSVPs from 10% of the people I invited. I didn't know how to plan whether it would be a big deal or whether it would be a big bust, or people would come without even letting me know. It was awful. When I heard about her experience, I thought about mine because basically about the same thing happened, and I'd made the assumption that people would come whether they had RSVP'd or not. Now, this is not a podcast about manners. (laughs) Although, I did take etiquette. After all, I grew up in the Deep South. I walked with a book on my head and learned to recite Shakespearean sonnets. But if you've ever 
hosted an event or given a party, you may have had a similar experience. And it's getting to be more and more common. People are trying everything. Lavish wedding invitations with butterflies escaping from them and email invites with music and flashy graphics. Save the date announcements. All with the purpose of getting people to respond and to commit. So when I heard about her experience and thought about my own, what's going on that we become so nonchalant and even disrespectful? And I can think harshly about people and think, well, we're just not as nice as we used to be, but I don't know about that. I wonder if it's about increasing social anxiety. As I said in the intro, anxiety itself is the number one mental health issue in the United States. It far outranks depression. And social anxiety disorder is the second in line as far as prevalence. And what is social anxiety or social phobia as it's sometimes called? People with social anxiety usually experience significant distress in the following situations. Being introduced to other people, being teased or criticized, being the center of attention, being watched or observed while doing something, having to say something in a formal public situation. Now, that may be more performance anxiety, actually. Meeting people in authority, feeling insecure and out of place in social situations. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Embarrassing easily. Meeting other people's eyes, swallowing, writing, talking or making phone calls if in public. All of these can look like folks who are very socially anxious. The contradictory thing is that it's not that people with social anxiety don't want to reach out to other people. They often do. They just have so much anxiety that it prevents them or can prevent them from doing so. Fear holds them back. So they have panic attacks at the thought of facing a crowd At its worst, the anxiety can morph into what's called agoraphobia, which is an intense fear of even leaving your own home. Social anxiety can be confronted, but it takes work. Yet apart from an actual diagnosis of social anxiety, it would not surprise me to learn that people are staying away from commitment because their discomfort with being with other people has risen substantially. And so now we're going to talk about the effect of social media on commitment. We text. We Facebook, we Snap, we Instagram, we pin. But we don't look each other in the eye. When we're staring at a screen, any screen, we can avoid being evaluated in the moment. You don't necessarily feel on the spot. We don't have to deal with questions about graduating from college, which didn't quite happen. Our kid's new job. She was let go and is back home. What we're doing for summer break. It's not planned and we can't afford it, or whether or not we're going to the gym and you haven't been there in over a month. You avoid all these potential situations. So if you get an invitation to an event where you fear these questions will put you on the spot, you tuck that invitation back into whatever crevice it popped up from and wait. It's too much to think about. I don't know who else is going. I may not feel like it that day. That's one of my favorites. All of these excuses or reasons are about insecurity, worry, pure anxiety. So we stay away from the commitment. Instead of staying in the present and focusing on what is happening in the moment, many of us constantly worry about what might happen in the future. And social media seems to be influencing this issue a lot, both commitment and increasing social anxiety, somewhat weirdly. Let's think about people talking about volunteering after retirement. What do they say? Oh, I'm not sure I want to commit. Is that all about appreciating the freedom of retirement? It could be. But could it also be that introducing yourself to a new environment where you don't have your old status or your old structure, where you'll have to learn the ropes and be a little vulnerable, causes anxiety? You bet. So what can we do about it? You know, I'm all about what you can do about it here on Self Work. If you have an unanswered invitation in your email or on your Facebook page, if you're considering volunteering or joining a club, if you've received announcements of coming events and you haven't responded, try this. Sit down and write out the reasons you aren't answering, that you're avoiding the commitment. What makes you nervous about going? What are you predicting might happen that you're not prepared for? How rational are the things 
that you've written down. For example, I'll use myself as an example. I've gained some weight. There's something about (laughs) blogging and podcasting a lot that I'm not getting out and walking as much. So, you know, part of me that has a little body image issue is hesitant to go because I think, oh, people are going to notice that I've gained weight. (laughs) Well, that's not true. People don't care, one. And they're all so self-conscious themselves that they really won't care. I'm the one who cares. So that's not a rational reason I don't want to go, right? Or I do make myself go, but that gremlin is my own. So if they're not rational, can you find a way to laugh at yourself a little bit like I just did or get a more reasonable perspective? Can you decide to even tolerate being nervous? What's so wrong with being nervous? What could you do beforehand in order to help yourself be less anxious? What could you plan to do when going to an event to keep yourself calm? What options do you have that might help? If I'm nervous about going to something, for example, when I walk in, I'll always scan the room and try to find the person that I think is in the same boat I am, that they're a little nervous about being there. And I'll walk over. I might say, gosh, I get a little nervous in situations like this, or I might not. I might just ask them questions about themselves. That's always a good thing to do. Most people feel very flattered when you're asking them about themselves, at least simple things. However, we've got to realize that not responding or not committing is a choice and will only increase the social anxiety that you feel. If you stay uncommitted or silent, you're actually committed to hiding, at least for the moment or the day or the week. And I promise you, hiding will do nothing for social anxiety. Because if you don't practice confronting that anxiety, it may only grow worse. And then there are other methods to help you with your anxiety. There's something called mindfulness, where literally you practice staying in the present. John Kabat-Zinn and his colleagues have written some great books on mindfulness. One is called Full Catastrophe Living, where you're living with a chronic illness And he's written another one on depression, which right now I can't remember the exact name, but it will be in the show notes. Meditation is something that can really help you focus your mind. And I like the app Headspace because it really teaches you how to meditate. And what meditation is, it teaches you how to focus your mind. Where when you get socially anxious, then you can bring your thoughts back and calm yourself instead of them running and running and running and running and running and you ruminate. That's not what you want to do with social anxiety. Exercise, of course, can feel great and really help overly anxious people. And then there are different medications for anxiety. you got to be careful with benzodiazepines because they are highly addictive, things like Valium, Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin. But you can talk to your medical doctor about their careful use. There are also medications called beta blockers, which can be very effective for people, especially with anxiety in specific situations. But one of the things I think is the most helpful thing to remember is that everyone has their own insecurities. They may not look insecure, but one of the gifts of being a therapist is recognizing that we all have things that we're anxious about or feel insecure about. If you see me any time in the next couple of weeks, if you're local, you'll probably think, ah, is she worried about her weight? (laughs) But you wouldn't have known that had I not announced it in the podcast. We all have our insecurities, every last one of us. And by the way, next time you get that invitation or someone calls you and says, hey, you want to meet me for lunch or whatever it is, try to confront your own avoidance of that commitment. Healing social anxiety takes practice. And so accepting the opportunities to practice is the first step. Good luck. The email from a listener today is about her reaction to some of my podcasts on perfectly hidden depression. She says, good morning, Dr. Rutherford. I've wanted to write for a long time, but make a business out of getting distracted. I'm from Australia and have mastered the deception of hiding my true feelings my perfectly hidden depression, and my shame at not being able to fix myself. You see, I'm the family and friend for everyone to talk to or cry to or moan to and work through issues, but I don't seem to be able to find that same source of comfort for myself. 
So through my constant seeking, I found your blog and then podcast. Wow, I'm so, so grateful. As I walk my dogs or load the dishwasher, your voice gives me great comfort, and I absolutely love your advice, self-reflection, and wisdom. I can practically feel the value and empathy you give to every email question, so thank you. That touched me a lot. (laughs) Anyway, continuing. Not sure if you realize that you stretch this far to down under, but on the days you're not so sure, please remember the impact you're having on my life, which is complex to say the least. Have a wonderful week, and the fact you found your gift to pass on to others has inspired me to keep searching, even on those bumpy days. So, of course, thank you so much to this listener, my gosh. What a beautiful sentiment to send to me, and I'm so glad that my work has found a home in your own life. It sounds like it's more than time for you to be aware of your own needs and spend a little time trying to meet them. But I want to address what you mean by fixing yourself. Maybe that there are things that are still present in your life that you struggle with. If that's the case, I'll share with you what I've noticed about myself and others. I don't believe necessarily that we ever fix whatever the vulnerabilities we have due to childhood, culture, trauma, abuse, family dynamics, whatever. What we can do and to live fairly well, must do, is get better at recognizing when those vulnerabilities are governing our current thoughts or actions. For example, I was highly overprotected as a kid, so I became someone who ferociously fought against others helping me. This may have worked then, but now is not so hot a response. I have to watch when my independent tendencies sneak up on me. I may never fix it, but I can become better at recognizing and even having a sense of humor about it. I can ask for help, for example. And I'm delighted to know I've got an Australian contingent. Your country is one that's on my bucket list to visit. And then I said, if you have any ideas for podcasts that might be helpful to you, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll be thinking of you. Take very good care. So I want to stress that I may have a patient who has come in five years ago and they come back in and they'll say something like, well, you and I talked about this five years ago and I thought I had it all fixed, but it's come back. Well, after watching this for 25 years, I've kind of figured out, you know, we're always going to be the same people that we were. We're going to have the same vulnerabilities. I will always be ferociously independent, as I told her. But you get better at knowing when that is not a helpful dynamic or a helpful choice. I had a podcast on something very similar to this called How to Be an Emotional Grown-Up, which many of you have listened to, actually, but maybe I'll sell it here again. (laughs) But it really is about noticing when strategies or patterns or choices that you made as a child aren't working for you as an adult, and so tweaking them into something that does work. So thanks again to this listener from Australia. I'm so glad you're there and all the rest of you. If you're ever in Arkansas, let me know. There are many ways to reach me. In fact, lots of ways. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. And so many of you have sent in a question or a comment And that really means a lot. I'm over on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I post my own posts there, but also ones that I find interesting or valuable. So that might be something you'd want to do. I so appreciate it when you leave a rating or a review. I still see 30, 32 or 3, something like that, patients a week. And so I either get up really early in the morning or use my weekends to do this podcast. So it's helpful to me to know that people are looking forward to listening. And subscriptions or ratings and reviews are a way I know that. I'd love for you to subscribe either wherever you listen or on my own website, where again, you'll get a newsletter once a week, I promise no more, (laughs) where you'll receive a weekly podcast as well as blog post. And I try not to sell too many things to you because in fact, I don't sell much to you at all, do I? (laughs) But I do have a little gift book called Marriage is Not for Chickens. It's available on Amazon. It's a very short book based on a post that appeared on the Huffington Post about my 24-year-old marriage at the time. That post received 200,000, over 200,000 likes and 53,000 shares. So I made it into a book with beautiful photography 
And I think it's a lovely gift to give someone that you're committed to. Speaking of commitment, (laughs) again, available on Amazon, marriage is not for chickens. (laughs) Thanks so much for being here. Take very good care. And I'll see you next week. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work. <laughs>